This is a video for the residents and fellows in dermatopathology and dermatology, and pathology for that matter, uh, in which I'm going to show you how I approach uh, subepidermal blisters. In this first slide, it's a rather idealized uh, collection of images of a patient suffering from bullous pemphigoid. Uh, and in, the, in this clinical image, we can see the very typical features where there are they're large, there are one to two centimeter diameter, uh, tense blisters, they're rather shiny, and there's a background you can just make out of erythema. And this is as good as it gets when you, you, you're looking at a patient with bullous pemphigoid. And underneath, we see the histology. There's a subepidermal blister, and in the bottom right quadrant, you can see that the dermal papillae project into the blister cavity, and this is sometimes called festooning, and it's a feature one typically associates with bullous pemphigoid. In the middle, we see a IgG deposition in a linear fashion along the basement membrane region, characteristic of bullous pemphigoid. And here in the immunoperoxidase uh, slide, uh, the skin has been stained with an antibody to, to type 4 collagen. And this outlines the basement membrane. And we can see that the blister cavity is, is formed above the basement membrane. In other words, it's within the lamina lucida. And that fits very well with bullous pemphigoid. On the far right, we have electron microscopy, which I'll show you later on, in which the blister cavity develops between the lamina denser, which is lying along the floor of the blister cavity and the cell membrane of the keratinocyte. And uh, to, for completeness sake, uh, immunoblotting, if you're able to perform it, will show that the uh, antigens in question in the autoimmune disease are the bullous pemphigoid 1 and 2 antigens at 230 and 180 kilodaltons. Now when we think about subepidermal blisters uh, it's useful to touch very briefly on the, the pathogenesis of these lesions. In the inherited condition epidermolysis bullosa uh, the patients suffer from a variety of uh, inherited defects in basement membrane constituents. And interestingly, the, the same basement membrane constituents are the target of the autoantibodies in the autoimmune bullous dermatoses. Interface dermatitis can sometimes form blisters. We may see bullous lichen planus and bullous drug eruptions. And in particular, we see subepidermal blisters underlying the necrotic epidermis in toxic epidermal necrolysis. Blisters are, are a feature of porphyria and cutaneous amyloidosis. And importantly, they may be seen in insect bites. It's important for the dermatologist to make sure that they, they're aware of the patient's medication, and in particular to make sure that they know any over-the-counter drugs the patients may have bought, because these may be of importance in the pathogenesis of blistering diseases. Rarely vasculitis, uh, leukocytoclastic vasculitis may be associated with an overlying blister, as indeed may Sweet's disease. I'm going to talk primarily on two autoimmune subepidermal blistering diseases, and these are bullous pemphigoid and epidermolysis bullosa or acquisitor because these are the two that are most often confused with each other. Linear IgA disease is, is self-explanatory. If the immunofluorescence shows the linear deposition of IgA, well then the diagnosis is fairly easy. 
So when we are looking at a subepidermal blister, we try to use all the in available information that we can get our hands on. The clinical features can certainly be of help, but I would stress, and I'll show you later, that there's sufficient clinical overla overlap that sometimes they can be misleading. And the same applies to the, to the histology. I think particularly particularly valuable in subepidermal blistering diseases uh, is the immunofluorescence finding, particularly if you're able to use sodium chloride split skin in indirect studies. That's really a very helpful technique. And similarly, uh, I find that uh, using immunoperoxidase to demonstrate the basement membrane region on paraffin embedded material is another great technique for coming to a more definitive diagnosis. When I was at St. John's, I spent a long time looking at the electron microscopy of blisters and the immunoelectron microscopy, and that, that used to be the state of the art. But then the, uh, the scientists took over with various molecular techniques and my electron microscopy became redundant. And that was when I got into melanocytic lesions, but then that's a whole different story, which I'll talk about some other time. Now, the clinical features that we think about with subepidermal blisters are, are pretty obvious, and they're listed on the left side. Age at presentation is, uh, is of great importance. Obviously, uh, if a baby or the very young infant uh, develops severe blistering diseases, we, we tend to think of uh, epidermolysis bullosa. And a family history would give support to that. If the patient's a female and has been or is recently pregnant, well then femphigoid gestation is maybe something worth thinking about. Big blisters are characteristic of bullous pemphigoid and little blisters or vesicles and excoriation are typical of dermatitis or petiformis. And scarring is something that would suggest in a young patient or in a child uh, that would raise the possibility of dystrophic variants of epidermolysis bullosa, whereas in an adult or older patient, we might think of cicatricial pemphigoid or linear IgA disease. And I've mentioned drugs and bites, etc. Now, this is a complicated looking slide, but really all it does is it shows you how my mind works when I look at a blister. The first thing I do is to try and sort out what I think is the predominant inflammatory cell type in the blister cavity and in, and in the underlying dermis. And so one can classify them in one's mind's eye as neutrophil-rich, eosinophil-rich, lymphohistiocytic, and cell-poor. The problem is, however, that you, you see lots of neutrophils, so your mind goes, okay, this is dermatitis herpetiformis. And it may well be, but the problem is uh, epidermolysis bullosa acquisitor, for example, is also often neutrophil-rich and rarely uh, vesicular pemphigoid in which the patient presents with a DH-like clinical appearance, and that's neutrophil-rich, so uh, it can be a problem. And the same thing goes for eosinophils. We think of them as being something we see in bullous pemphigoid, but as you see below, there may also be a feature of epidermolysis bullosa or acquisitor, linear IgA disease, and so on. And so although the histology can give you pointers in the right direction, uh, other techniques are necessary before we can reach a, a more definitive diagnosis. I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about immunofluorescence, immunoperoxidase, uh, and I'll touch on EM and immunoblotting. So the problems that we face in the diagnosis of subepidermal blisters are that everything overlaps. The clinical features, the histology, they overlap. The immunofluorescence findings, the electron microscopy findings overlap. 
and even immunoblotting sometimes overlaps. So to make a diagnosis of a subepidermal autoimmune blistering disorder, we've really got to take as much of these features as we can together in the hopes that we'll get to a definitive diagnosis. And here, here's a nice show showing how the clinical appearances can be problematical. These are three images very kindly shared with me, and as you can see, a large, tense, dome-shaped, shiny blister on the thigh, on the thigh again, and this is on the shin, I believe. Uh, and these would all morphologically look very nice for a bullous pemphigoid. But when we look at the di actual diagnoses, we'll see that the top left is linear IgA disease, the bottom one is bullous systemic lupus erythematosus, and the top right is bullous pemphigoid. And here we see histological overlap. Dermal, neutrophil dermal papillary microabscesses are typical of derma, derma, dermatitis epitiformis. Well, here we have four neutrophil dermal micro, microabscesses. Are all these patients suffering from dermatitis epitiformis? Well, no, they aren't. Top left is vesicular pemphigoid, bottom left is bus bullous systemic lupus erythematosus, bottom right is epidermolysis bullosa acquisita, and only this one actually represents dermatitis epitiformis, and so histological overlap is problematical. And this summarizes the problems with neutrophil rich and deosinophil rich classification. Just in passing, linear IgA disease can do both. EBA can do both. Bullous pemphigoid can do both. So histology is a problem. Now, what about immunofluorescence? Well, in bullous pemphigoid, we expect to see linear Ig IgG deposition along the basement membrane region, and that's fine. And this is an example of bullous pemphigoid showing just that. Now, in the context of this talk, I'm, I'm highlighting bullous pemphigoid and inflammatory epidermolysis bullosa acquisitor. And you can see that that is also associated with linear IgG deposition at the basement membrane region, as indeed, for that matter, so is bullous systemic lupus erythematosus. So this immunofluorescence pattern is not specific. I just had to add this one. When I was at St. John's, I, I, I was very keen to try and get the renal immunoperoxidase, immunoglobulin staining working on paraffin-embedded skin biopsies from blistering patients. And this is one example where I was able to show linear deposition of IgG in a patient with immunofluorescence-confirmed bullous pemphigoid. I thought this was really quite a useful technique, but for reasons I've never understood, it just didn't catch on. So what is the role of the histopathologist? Well, I think we can do three things pretty easily. We can make a judgment as to whether it's autoimmune or not with immunofluorescence. We can establish a histological differential diagnosis very easily. And most importantly, I think we can determine the site of the split in relation to the lamina densa. Now, this photo electron micrograph on the right comes from me, and so I'd like to think it's normal skin, at least I hope it is. And if we look at it at the top left, this is the nucleus of the basal keratinocyte. And then underneath, you can see the toner filaments, the keratin filaments, if you like. And deep to that is the cell membrane of the basal keratinocyte, and these are the hemidesmosomes. Underneath the hemidesmosome is a clear space, and this is called the lamina lucida. And it's traversed by very thin filaments called anchoring filaments, which join the hemidesmosome to this underlying electron-dense structure, which is the lamina densa. 
and the lamina densa is held onto the connective tissues in the dermis by the anchoring fibrils which we see here. These are composed of type 7 collagen. And what we're trying to do when we look at a blister is to determine whether the blister developed in the lamina lucida region or whether it developed in the sublamina densa. Bullus pemphigoid develops in the lamina lucida. Epidermolysis bullosa develops in the sublamina densa. So just to focus particularly on bullous pemphigoid and epidermolysis bullosa acquisita. Bullous pemphigoid is a not, it's not desperately rare. It's a disease which, which uh, particularly affects the elderly, but it can be seen in the younger age groups. And in fact, you can very rarely uh, encounter it in, in infants and very, very young children where it it often presents around the external genitalia, and that's of great importance because you may encounter such a patient and mistake this for evidence of child abuse. And so it's important that you bear this in mind before you uh, contact social services and, and so on. Patients with bullous pemphigoid, they don't necessarily present with blisters. They can present with what's known as a prodrome, uh, in which they, they, they may have intense itch or paritis, or they may develop urticarial lesions or large erythematous macules or even erythroderma. But sooner or later, the blisters develop, and as I've mentioned, they, they tend to occur predominantly on the abdomen, the inner thighs, and the flexures. And this is a lovely example of bullous pemphigoid. You can see this great big blister. It's absolutely stuffed full of fluid and fibrin and inflammatory cells. It's tense. It looks as if it's ready to pop. And if we look at the underlying dermis, you get a hint of the festooning I mentioned earlier. And when we look at the inflammatory cells, we can see there are large numbers of eosinophils, so that there are also lymphocytes, histiocytes, and scattered neutrophils. And if we biopsy patients in the prodromal phase, you can sometimes see eosinophilic spongiosis very nicely demonstrated in this field and uh, in the one on the right. And exceptionally, a uh, biopsy may reveal a subepidermal sub eosinophil microabscess. Now, what about the immunofluorescence in bullous pemphigoid? Well, we expect to see linear IgG and complement in the overwhelming majority of, of patients. It's certainly at least 90% of cases. But if you have a negative immunofluorescence on direct examination, it's well worth your while performing indirect studies because you may pick up the extra 10%. They, uh, on indirect, there's a sensitivity of about 75 to 80%. If you use split skin as a substrate, it increases sensitivity to 90% and it has the advantage of also distinguishing between bullous pemphigoid and epidermolysis bullosa, and I'll come to that later. And this is a lovely example of IgG deposition in bullous pemphigoid outlining the basement membrane region. Now what about epidermolysis bullosa acquisita? Well, when it was originally described, it was thought to be uh, a, a mechanobullous dermatosis, a, a, a disease in which patients were susceptible to minor trauma, and they tended to get blisters around their acrocytes, particularly the backs of the hands and fingers. And uh, it, subsequently, however, it was shown that in fact, most patients with epidermolysis below the requisite to have antibodies to type 7 collagen. And this is the one that we're particularly interested in at the moment. Uh, epidermolysis below the requisite 
can in fact, it can mimic bullous pemphigoid, it can mimic dermatitis repetiforma, cicatricial pemphigoid. There's a linear IgA disease variant showing uh, EBA features, and you may also see the condition in childhood. Now, this is an example of the so-called classical mechanobullous variant of EBA, where here, I think this is the heel, and there's a, an old ruptured blister on the left, but there's a very nice tense dome-shaped blister on the right. And if we look at that histologically, we can see that it's a subepidermal cell-free blister. There's some fibrin and edema fluid, but inflammatory cells are pretty well absent. And this is confirmed with these higher power views showing the abundant fibrin along the base of the blister cavity, but there really aren't any inflammatory cells at all. Now, in contrast, this is a dermatitis repetiformis-like example of inflammatory epidermolysis bullosa. And here we see uh, little vesicles and the excoriations and erythematous papules on the back of the elbow mimicking dermatitis repetiformis. Patients with linear IgA disease can also present with flexural blisters uh, suggesting bullous pemphigoid, so it, it can mimic either disease. And this is histology of the, of the example I've shown you. This is a subepidermal neutrophil-rich uh, blister, so this is really indistinguishable from dermatitis repetiformis. And in this example, from a different a different patient, sorry, uh, we can see a, a subepidermal blister. It's a large blister. It's full of fibrin, edema fluid. And when we look at the floor of the blister, we can see numerous eosinophils. And if we look at the underlying dermis, there's a, a mixed infiltrate of eosinophils, a few neutrophils, lymphocytes, and histiocytes. But all of these eosinophils give rise to this bullous pemphigoid-like appearance. What about the immunofluorescence in inflammatory EBA? Well, rather like bullous pemphigoid, it's characterized by linear deposition of IgG and C3 on direct immunofluorescence. Some, some examples show linear IgA deposition, as I mentioned earlier. Now, the indirect is not as, not as sensitive. We only see us, uh, uh, up 25 to 50% of patients show antibodies on indirect immunofluorescence. But again, if you use split skin as a substrate, the sensitivity goes up quite a bit. So the problem we face in distinguishing between Bullous pemphigoid and epidermolysis, epidermolysis bullosa acquisita is that the clinical, the histology, and the immunofluorescence may appear identical. And so to get around this, we have to use different techniques. Uh, I've mentioned split skin in immunofluorescence. We can use antigen mapping. And in the old days, I used electron microscopy, but nowadays immunoblotting and other molecular techniques are invaluable. Now, this is split skin immunofluorescence in which normal skin has been slit by, split by uh, uh, um, the use of sodium chloride solution. And this is the immunofluorescence, and you can see that the staining in this case due using antibodies to laminin have shown that the basement membrane lies along the floor of the blister cavity uh, and this is very very useful in indirect immunofluorescence and if we summarize uh, the localization when we use split skin uh, diseases associated with staining in the roof of the blister are bullous pemphigoid uh, pemphigoid gest gestationis, most of cicatricial pemphigoids, and some linear IgA diseases. Whereas the floor of the blister 
is characterized by labeling uh, in EBA, bullous systemic lupus erythematosus, and some of the pemphigoid and cicatricial pemphigoid patients. But for practical purposes, if we use split skin, if uh, in patients with bullous pemphigoid, the fluorescence labels the roof of the blister in bullous pemphigoid, the floor of the blister in EBA. So it's a very simple way of distinguishing between the two diseases. Now, I, 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 uh, I was very keen and still am keen on using uh, antigen mapping to distinguish between these two diseases, and it really is very simple. Uh, all you need is an antibody to type 4 collagen, which works perfectly well on paraffin embedded material. So there's bullous pemphigoid, and we can see there's a subepidermal blister. We know the blister in bullous pemphigoid develops between the lamina denser and the keratinocyte. There's the lamina denser. There's the epidermis, so the blister is in the lamina lucida. Here we have EBA with an evolving blister. There's the roof of the blister there. The roof of the blister is occupied by type 4 collagen, so the blister is sublamina denser. So simple differentiation between the two disease, diseases using paraffin antigen mapping. Now, if, if we use uh, electron microscopy, uh, we'll see that, in the, that uh, bullous pemphigoid typically arises in the lamina lucida. This is the roof of the blister cavity. This is the basal keratinocyte that's lost its hemidesmosomes, and that's an eosinophil. And this is the blister cavity. So the lamina dense is way down here. And in contrast, this is an example of epidermolysis bullosa acquisita. This is the basal keratinocyte. There's the uh, lamina denser. There are the anchoring fibrils. This is the blister cavity. So the blister has arisen deep to the lamina denser. So we can make a distinction between EVA and bullous pemphigoid very easily on the electron microscopy. And these are two nice examples showing a low power of bullous pemphigoid where the uh, lamina denser is along the floor of the blister cavity. It shows nice festooning, as we mentioned on the histology. And on high power, you see the lamina denser on the floor of the blister cavity. So the blister occurs in the lamina lucida. This is epidermolysis bullosa, and here we can see the, in the roof of the cavity, the lamina denser is present on the roof of the blister, and we see that in high power here. So the blister cavity is arising in the lam sublamina denser. And when I was at St. John's, I did a lot, lot of electron microscopy and immunoelectron microscopy. And this is bullous pemphigoid. We can see the immunoperoxidase labeling is on the cell membrane and on the hemidesmosomes and within the lamina lucida. Uh, and the same thing uh, with immunogold. Whereas in epidermolysis bullosa acquisita, the immunoperoxidase is deep to the lamina densa. There's the lamina densa going along there, and there are the deposits there. And this is the same thing with immunogold. This is the lamina densa here. Those are, are the anchoring fibrils, and there are the immune deposits at the tips of the anchoring fibrils. However, as I mentioned, immunoblotting took over my role, uh, and you can see that uh, it, it's a very valuable technique in identifying which particular antigens are affected in, in an autoimmune bullous dermatosis, and this became the golden standard. Uh, and nowadays, this is commonly used as are other molecular techniques. And just to just to summarize the 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 antigens involved, 
Bullus pemphigoid is the uh, are the two anti antigens, one eighty and two thirty kilodaltons. Many sacrificial pemphigoids are show, show antibodies against the same protein, but there are also other variants against lamin and five and beta four integrin. Uh, Epidermal isopelose requisitor is type seven collagen. Bullosystemic lupus erythematosus is type 7 collagen. Some examples of linear IgA disease are associated with antibodies against type 7 collagen, and some patients with linear IgA disease are associated with antibodies against the bullous pemphigoid antigens. So you can see that there are still problems. So in conclusion, I think cl clinical pathological correlation doesn't have as much value as I'd like to have thought it would have done in the diagnosis of subepidermal blisters. And I think that uh, although electron microscopy and immunoelectron microscopy have contributed a lot to the to our understanding of blistering diseases, nowadays, if we can use split skin immunofluorescence, if we can use in you know peroxidase mapping techniques, that will go a long way to enable us to come to a fairly secure diagnosis in most cases of subepidermal blistering dermatoses. Thank you very much. I hope you find that useful.